tonight we're going to be talking about another controversial topic, the war in Iraq and the decision to invade Iraq uh, back over the course of 2002, 2003. Uh, you know, that we had in the 90s had, you know, a paradigm of, uh, of containment. Uh, there was a whole lot of friction with Iraq, but eventually it, uh, it came to a decision to, to enter Iraq and to overthrow and replace its government. Uh, and that's particularly remarkable since in, in uh, the 2000 election, George W. Bush had run uh, as a critic of nation building and then ended up engaging in what was effectively one of America's biggest uh, nation building projects in decades. Uh, so to dig into this, uh, we've got one of the people who's probably best equipped out of many uh, to uh, to answer this question, Michael J. Mazar, who is a senior political scientist at the Rand Corporation. Yeah, he comes there with a lot of experience at places like the U.S. National War College, the Stimson Center, CSIS, uh, time on the Hill, time with the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, and he has a PhD from uh, the University of Maryland. But we're really focusing tonight on a, uh, a 2019 book that he wrote called Leap of Faith, Hubris, Negligence, and America's Greatest Foreign Policy Tragedy, for which he interviewed dozens of the players involved in the deliberations about the invasion of Iraq and reviewed all the documents that had been class declassified at the point of its publication. Uh, so, Michael, welcome. And if you could set the stage for us a bit on the things that lead up to, uh, you know, overthrow, uh, overthrowing Saddam being a plausible decision, because, you know, the United States had, had kind of had some alignment with Saddam uh, during the Iran-Iraq war. There's the famous picture of Donald Rumsfeld meeting him. Uh, and then we went to war with him in 1991. We had these no-fly zones throughout the 90s. We, you know, bombed him a couple times, uh, and then that shifted. So what was what was the backstory on this long confrontation? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, and um, it, it's it's a question that left a number of people in I think 2002 kind of wondering why we were suddenly headed for war. In fact, it had really unfolded over a long period of time, and. So you're right that during the late 80s, during the Iran-Iraq war, um, the United States was sort of sidling up to Saddam and, and James Baker and others were undertaking kind of diplomatic missions to try to see if this was somebody that we could work with, obviously to balance, um, a balance Iran. But that actually did not go all that far. Um, and fairly quickly, you know, even by the end of the first Bush administration, and then when we get into Clinton there's not a whole lot of thought, partly because of his human rights record and just the sense that he's he's very uh, mercurial and dangerous. Um, the idea of really kind of embracing him uh, went by the wayside. But then there was sort of a you know general deterrent, hands off containment kind of approach up until the late Clinton administration. And this is one of the things that I talk about in in the book that I found kind of interesting. Um, was that by 99, the Clinton folks had really gotten to a point of believing that regime change was the only option, or I should say a subset of the Clinton national security officials. Um, and the reasons were uh, a sort of a version of the same reasons we heard later, that Saddam was danger, posed a danger to uh, other countries in the region, that he was involved with extremists and terrorist groups, although they never brought that to the degree that the later Bush administration would that he was working on weapons of mass destruction, uh, although, and, and at this time, you know, they were beginning to get the intelligence reports that would later kind of exaggerated intelligence reports that would later be used by the Bush administration, but that was going on in the IC before that transition. So for a variety of reasons, a number of folks, particularly at the NSC had decided by 99 that Saddam had to go, that leaving him in place for a long period of time just didn't work for US national security interests. Meanwhile, outside of government, you had folks like Paul Wolfowitz, who had been kind of embracing the Iraqi exile resistance for some time and had been dreaming up ideas in the 90s of sort of Bay of Pig style, you know, we'll find a brigade of free Iraqis that will equip them and give them a little air support. They'll drive to Baghdad and overturn the regime. And none of that was going to be feasible. But they were thinking about the same sort of thing. I believe all that would have remained 
essentially on the back burner had it not been for 9-11. Um, w- when you have the transition to the Bush administration, there's this sense of we're not sure how long we can live with Saddam. But in the minds of most people, that had not at all turned into a belief that the United States should undertake a military operation to overthrow him. And I don't know that we ever would have got there. So the the kind of world we see ourselves in with North Korea today, I think, is a very plausible long term, would have been a plausible long term future with Iraq, where not that he would have had a nuclear arsenal of that size and and Israel would have certainly prevented it, I think, uh, if we didn't. But you know, he would have been toying around with those weapons. He would have been dangerous. We would have been in this unsatisfying position of uh, desiring a new government, but not really being willing to do anything about it. And we might have just sort of got stuck there. So but I, it was sort of a long transition. And what really what I found interesting was that the view that the United States had to do something more decisive about Saddam predated the George W. Bush administration. Yeah, and so take us into a little bit more of that shift around uh, 9-11, you know, because part of it, you say, okay, like, yes, you know, there's this mass casualty terrorist attack originating in the Middle East or the greater Middle East. Uh, You know, needless to say, our threat perception around the Middle East is going to go up. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, a lot of folks looking back say Saddam is this secular dictator uh, what does he have to do with with Al Qaeda? Like, why why was it that decision makers at the time saw a a saw nine eleven as an impetus to act in Iraq? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and there's a number of reasons. I mean, one partial answer to your question is there was only a certain number of national security officials that saw it that way. Um, although folks like Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice eventually sort of get dragged along by this and, and in fact go along with it in ways that um, in retrospect, uh, maybe they shouldn't have, they were not the prime movers of it. And if the two of them, for example, had been in charge of US foreign policy at the time without any other voices, I don't think you would have had a US invasion of Iraq. But in, in folks like Cheney, uh, Wolfowitz, Doug Feith, a variety of other folks in DOD, folks in Cheney's office, obviously Scooter Libby, um, and other voices in the Republican national security community, you had folks who almost immediately, and as we know, I mean, the notes have come out that Rumsfeld, too, was jotting down notes at like 2.30 in the afternoon of 9-11, saying, you know, starting to talk about Saddam Hussein. Within hours of the attack, they're beginning to talk about him. First of all, because they suspected him. Obviously, that turned out to be not the case. And they were told that day it was probably not the case. They had this established idea that Saddam was somebody we couldn't live with. There were notions floating around. And this is where the intel piece is really kind of gets corrupted by outside information. On the WMD piece, the intelligence community was telling them some pretty worrying things. And um, you know, even uh, a, a variety of sort of longtime foreign service officers and others that I spoke to said, look, I was looking at the intelligence and it scared me, too. It wasn't that they were completely blowing it out of proportion. The intelligence on WMDs was mistaken, but it actually said sort of a version, except for Cheney, of what they said it did. But on the terrorist contacts, that's completely different. You have these folks outside government drawing these pictures of these spider webs of connections among terrorist groups, between terrorist groups and and, and regimes like Saddam, giving the impression that there's this international conspiracy forming against the United States. And we had to strike a death blow at it. Wolf Woods bought into that. I believe Fife bought into that. Certainly others in DOD and the vice president's office did. And so that idea that even if Saddam didn't support Al Qaeda with the attack, that he's integrated into this sinister network really took hold of the minds of folks. And there's no question that the intelligence community told them at the time, we see no evidence of that. This kind of global connection you're talking about doesn't exist. Saddam is not linked into Al Qaeda in that way. So that was clearly the case where folks like Cheney and Wolfwood simply ignored what the intelligence community was telling them. So they had a WMD risk, they thought Saddam was tied in with terrorism. And then there's another piece that is very difficult to measure, but I think it had a real effect and that is the simple, crude, blunt desire to show strength. And you see this in part in the discussion that, you know, when Rumsfeld knows will say, there's just not enough targets in Afghanistan. We're not gonna make the a big enough effect to convince the world that if you mess with the United States in this way, there's going to be a price to pay. 
Thomas Friedman had an op-ed at the time where he endorsed this and said, we just have to go kick somebody's rear end. Uh, I talked to a number of officials inside government who said that this was a real, it was never sort of you know, put before the president in a memo to say, we have to do this, at least as far as I saw. But it was definitely in the, in the backs of their minds. So for a variety of reasons, you have this critical mass of folks around the president who immediately come to the conclusion that an implication of 9-11 is that this emerging sense that we couldn't live with Saddam, we now had to actually make that a reality and we had to act decisively. And those people were enough to, to bring um, George W. Bush on board, in part because others who doubted them in the administration either didn't speak up or were sidelined. Yeah, and so that gets to the question of the actual decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, who decided, who really shaped that decision, uh, and what was kind of the, the process around that decision? So in terms of the last part of that, the process was pretty miserable. I mean, as I document in the book, and as has now come out a lot, um, there really was never a process around the actual decision to go to war. There's no question that George Bush made the decision. He gave the order to start U.S. military operations. He gave that order in March of 2003. And so he can say, I didn't decide until then. As, as I argue in the book, essentially the decision was made in the minds of many people. I don't think George W. Bush, but I really believe Rumsfeld, Cheney, Wolf Woods, a variety of others on 9-11 that this was going to happen in some fashion. Now, would the U.S. stage a complete invasion or would they try one of Wolf Woods' schemes he'd been working up to find some exile Iraqis? That was left to be determined. But that decision was made very quickly. And what you had was kind of a, uh, a submerged decision that was made immediately, and then a number of people operating on that assumption, really from certainly November, December 2001, all the way through. And then you have this public debate, discussion, do we go to the UN or not? What do we say to Tony Blair? Is he coming along? And during that process, from the people I spoke to, from what I saw, I think it is accurate to say that George W. Bush took some time to make the final, uh, the, the, the final judgment took some time to settle in his mind. By the summer of 2002, clearly it was in place. I think there's evidence by about February, March of that year that he was pretty much settled that this was gonna happen unless Saddam took some remarkable actions under international uh, inspections. And so you get this you know, episode um, in uh, uh, June of 2002, where the head of policy planning at state, um, Richard Haas, goes to Condoleezza Rice and says, we hear all this talk about going to war. Shouldn't we have a process to decide? And she says, you know what? Just don't waste your breath. That decision has been made. And that's in the spring of 2002. And then, of course, there's a huge public discussion afterwards of whether we're still going to war. So it's confused, it's ad hoc, it emerges. And one of the real problems with that, and this is why I ultimately describe this as a case of negligent decision-making, um, is that as a result, you do not have the kind of really focused, intense assessment of the potential risks and costs of this war and the steps needed to mitigate those and the decisions we needed to make until really the very last minute or not even then. And so that partly results in the famous, infamous lack of phase four planning, post-war planning. Um, it accounts for the fact that they're, you know, calling up um, people to run the uh, Office of Reconstruction Humanitarian Assistance, um, you know, General Garner and others a month before it's gonna deploy to Iraq, which is just lunacy. Um, so it's a decision that was made, in my view, it was a decision that was sort of made immediately by a handful of people. But from the standpoint of a formal U.S. government process, it was, in a sense, never really made, except for the fact that a bunch of information was put in front of George W. Bush. And he eventually said, all right, I'm ordering you to do it. But that information was incomplete, poorly organized. So the result I find to be a highly negligent approach to the question of going to war, even separate from the question of whether you think it was justified or not, the way in which it was done is something, you know, one of the lessons for the future is uh, that sort of a policy should never uh, 
be, uh, you know, you matched or used again for a, a decision to go to war. And Ed, you mentioned, you know, that the, the Bush, you know, fairly early in 2002 had been thinking, uh, you know, we're doing this unless Saddam does something different. How long do you think that off ramp was there where Saddam kind of had a choice? Because remember, there was the ultimatum at the at the yeah. very end, like 24 hours or something. Well, and that was clearly just for show. I mean, you know, what's was kind of funny. And this is, you know, a lot of folks told me this and this is actually present in memos that have been declassified. It's kind of interesting that in both the Rumsfeld site and the memos or the work that was declassified for a time. And then I think pulled down from the book site of Doug Feist's book. There's a lot of sort of um, uh, self-condemning stuff that they <laughs> that they uh, declassified, but there's stuff in the documents where they were afraid that Saddam was going to take the off ramp. The advocates of war believed that they could never trust Saddam, whether he was under international inspections or not. And again, I think to some extent they believed that this was something the United States had to do for geopolitical credibility purposes. And they were afraid that this was going to happen. Uh, when was that off ramp no longer feasible? Um, you know, it's in terms of timing, I think he had it until fairly late. I mean, even in like February of 2003, if he had placed a phone call to, you know, the leaders of, of Great Britain, France, Japan, I don't know, a few others and said, look, all right, I'm taking it seriously now whatever went before and called in the IEA inspection teams and said, here's the head of my military. I'm giving them the order to give whatever you want. And suddenly all the news stories were Saddam capitulated. IEA says they have perfect access. Um, they're getting no restraints at all. Leaders of multiple countries say, okay, America, you had the effect you wanted. Saddam is climbing down. Uh, he's even agreed to cuts in his military forces, whatever. At that point, I think it would have been hard for the U.S. to go to war. I think Saddam had it within his power until very late to defuse this. The problem is that's not Saddam, right? I mean, that, that, his nature was never going to do something like that. And and partly because of his uh, belligerence, um, his cruelty, his arrogance, and also partly because of his fear. And as we know, you know, in the 90s, he did decide to get rid of essentially all of his WMD, but he decided not to publicize it because he was afraid if he did, that he would show weakness in regard to Iran. So for him to take an off ramp would have been essentially to abandon every aspect of the identity that he had tried to create for himself in Iraq for the prior, you know, couple of decades. And so I don't know that that was ever going to happen. So timing wise, it was available till late in terms of a practical option that he was really going to choose. I don't know that it was ever there. So uh, you in your book, you kind of talk about the war as an example of tragedy. Uh, and I'm curious, I'm curious, you know, to hear you lay out why you think it's that, because I know, like, for instance, some of the critics uh, of your book have said, you know, that's that's not a good lens to think yeah. about it, which understand this as as a crime yeah. or a conspiracy or any of these number of of alternative lenses. What made what made you say tragedy? Yeah, just because, like you say, I mean, I sort of distinguish it from, from the idea of a crime or a an, an, you know, an inherently illegitimate act as opposed to an act that is taken because in the minds of those who are doing it, they think it is the best thing for the country, but partly because of their own characteristics, uh, you know, it's it's destined to achieve something terrible. Um, and I and I really I still cling to that view. I mean, you know, I think a comparison would be even just in the last few days as we're looking at this Ukraine situation unfold. I don't know that anybody thinks the Biden administration wants war or that it wants to tempt Russian aggression through weakness. They are trying to find their way through an extraordinarily complex situation, balance a whole bunch of different you know, factors. And um, they have, you know, I think the, the best interest of the country at heart, and they have a certain view of what that means. So the same thing was true of George W. Bush and a lot of his senior officials. Now in the book, I'm extremely critical of a number of them, uh, particularly Rumsfeld including Cheney, but also including Condoleezza Rice, who I think didn't do her job as national security advisor during that period. And I make a strong argument at the end that this is a case of um, 
you know, what you can call a version of criminal negligence. So in that sense, yeah, it's people can be prosecuted for that. I guess it rarely happens. But so it's very negligent. But I think I really think it's very important to see these things as the uh, see these things, see times when the United States wages unnecessary war, not as the actions of stupid people, criminal people, uh, illegitimate or, you know, malign individuals, um, evildoers, because very few of these senior officials are that way. And they weren't viewed that way before they went to war. Lyndon Johnson wasn't viewed that way in his domestic program. So, you know, why it would apply on Vietnam, I'm not sure. So I just think it is really important if we want to build stronger barriers against waging unnecessary war to see the causes for what they are. Because I think if you start blaming, if you start attributing it to individuals, you know, George W. Bush was stupid. Dick Cheney was a criminal. Let's get them out. We'll get some other people in and we won't have bad wars anymore. Well, that's not going to work because the United States, through administrations of different flavor, you know, different degrees of interventionist impulses, different levels of aggress, whatever, you know, tragedies like Vietnam, tragedies like Afghanistan and Iraq continue to happen. And so I think it's much more important to focus on the political and structural context in which these decisions are made so that future decision makers of whatever kind um, ideally are forced in various ways to take the, these kind of decisions much more uh, seriously, to, to run them through a tougher gauntlet. But the last thing I will say about this is something that's really important to remember about Iraq, which has been true of a lot of wars we end up not liking. This was a war that had majority, by polling, majority support from the American people at the time it was waged. George W. Bush did not go around Congress. He went to Congress and got significant majorities voting to approve this war. This was a war that most major papers editorialized in favor of, including the Washington Post, New York Times. Many major columnists wrote articles in favor of. This was at the time it happened. And, you know, I don't know if some folks listening will remember this. I, just, I remember just very distinctly through a lot of 2002 thinking, what are we doing? This makes no sense. But the general environment in the country, and, I, and not just because there's a blob, but because when the country is attacked, there's going to be a certain kind of environment. The environment in the country and the national security community was such that, you know, if you had doubts, you eventually began to doubt yourself and say, well, they must know something I don't. Because of all these smart people who are presumably talking to the folks, I wasn't working at the Pentagon at the time, so I didn't see any classified information. I didn't see the planning. I assume these reporters were talking to the people doing the planning, getting ready for the war, who had access to the intelligence. You could see the public reports on the, what the intelligence community was saying. I figured they must know something that made this make more sense than it seemed like from the outside. And that to me is, is educational in the sense that at the moment a decision for war is made, um, it, it's easy later to say it was a crime and they knew better. But if a lot of us trying to follow these issues didn't necessarily know better, or we thought we did a bit, but it, the judgment became clouded, I think it's, um, it's, it, it inspires some humility in saying, you know, if I'd been in the, well, I certainly wouldn't have decided to go to war with Iraq, but if I'd been working at the Pentagon or somewhere else, you know, along with some other folks who doubted this, it wouldn't have happened. Um, I, I think that it's it's just a very these are really complex situations, and um, I, I honestly believe that viewing them as the result of criminal malign individuals is counterproductive for the goal of stopping these kinds of of unnecessary wars. Well, going to uh, you know some of those lessons for the future, and I'm curious what uh, what lessons you think future policymakers could should take from this. I mean, one, you know, we can talk at the systemic level about like, hey, what should the process be? Yeah. If you are somewhere in the system sitting there saying, this doesn't make sense to me, 
Yeah. Uh, and it seems like doing the right process on this and not thinking about it the right way. What do you do? Yeah. So a couple of things. Number one, I think one lesson of it is that the role of Congress is critical. Um, it is the constitutional check on uh, a handful of individuals in the executive branch kind of, you know, um, the problem here again is, uh, as was the case then, these decisions will often be made when there is some uh, general perception of a threat to the country. And that's going to affect Congress as well. And an example that I, I found interesting to watch in the last few months has been the, the debate about U.S.-Taiwan uh, commitments, right? And although there hasn't been a sort of general vote, um, there's the beginning of some movement in Congress to, in one case, pre-authorize the use of force by a future American president, right, if this happens. And I just think that at one lesson of the Iraq case was that Congress did not do its job, even if it was going to eventually approve this war. The level of oversight undertaken on the intelligence that was used, on the war planning, on the, the risk management of this um, was just completely inadequate. And um, it's, it's very challenging to do. I understand that. I mean, I worked on the Hill. I know the difficulties for members of Congress of inserting themselves into those things. But I think that's one clear lesson is that in future cases, as many members of Congress as possible should interpret their role um, secondarily to worry about the politics of how to, they have to position themselves and primarily in terms of their obligation to the country to serve as a, as a, as a check on the decision. Secondly, I think within uh, the executive branch, within the administrations, um, you know, you can do some structural decision making things, but that really comes down to a specific president. If an individual president wants a better decision making process, he or she can make it happen. Um, I think one lesson of this is that all future presidents should want that to happen, should demand it and should uh, refuse to make any dis large scale decision for the use of force without a very elaborate interagency process that guarantees the ability for those with doubts and concerns to raise them. A great example in the Iraq case, you know, that that I write about was in February 2003, just before the war, there was this big planning event over at the National Defense University. Um, and um, Everybody who attended it walked away, people from state, people from NSC, people from other places in DOD, Central Command. Almost everybody who walked away from it think, went away thinking this is going to be a disaster. We absolutely do not have our act together. No one knows what's going on. They've declassified a lot of the slides that were presented there. And it is absolutely miserable reading to just see slide after slide. You know, we need this many people to plan for the energy sector in Iraq. We have zero. We need this much money. We have zero. <laughs> And that was a month before we went. So to, to create a process whereby that kind of information bubbles up and the number of um, dissent memos that were written can bubble up to uh, a national security advisor or president and they can get it, be better informed. But that depends on the president wanting it. And if the president doesn't want it, there's not, I think, much you can do to force that onto the system. A third and final thing I would say in terms of lessons, sort of decision-making lessons for the future, is kind of as I argue at the end, and to your point about blame, I mean, understanding that the, that the people involved are not criminal, you can still say people had the best of intentions and it was tragic, but they did not do their job properly. And the process was not run properly. And some people, namely Don Rumsfeld, took actions in the process that actively subverted the ability to make a good decision. And so I do think that you know, what's interesting and, and, you know, there's been discussion over the last few years, I think, of this issue of accountability in national security policy. Right. Um, and I don't know that there is any. I mean, you know, from I mean, McNamara certainly went through a period in the wilderness. But, you know, folks that were involved in this decision and who did not take actions to ensure that it was made better, even though we know in retrospect that they had severe doubts at the time. I don't know that they've suffered really any. So I think for the long term, and I have a couple of ideas in there, it's extraordinarily difficult. But I do think, you know, football coaches get fired when they, you know, they're, they're constantly assessed on what they're doing. University presidents constantly get assessed on what they're doing. National security officials during a decision and afterward are not really assessed apart from what, you know, folks like us write about them. Right. But sort of in a more formal way. Um, 
And I think there are certain principles you can establish of what a responsible national security advisor, national security official, defense official would do in a process. And you can ask later if it was done. And you could have, after every decision, after every sort of decision for war, I guess, um, or maybe at the conclusion of a war, I don't know, that might be too late, you could have some kind of independent commission kind of look into it and see, was there any negligence here? And convey to national security officials, you know, is that going to make a huge difference? I don't know. Because, of, you know, back to where we started, most of these folks think they're doing the right thing. And they work extraordinarily hard. They and the more most senior ones, as you know, deal with a thousand issues every day. It's not for lack of trying, really. But I still think there are standards of accountability that were not met in this case, that were not met by some officials in the Vietnam case, that were not met in the conduct of the Afghan war, as we see in the Afghanistan papers, that you could try to have a better way of holding people accountable to that. So that's a third piece. Excellent. And for those of you listening, uh, we are using the Q&A feature tonight on Zoom. So if you'd like to ask a question to Dr. Mazar, uh, drop it in there. And uh, you can also upvote others' questions if you see something you'd like, you'd like me to ask. Uh, one of the other big issues that you alluded to earlier, the, you know, the phase four planning question, uh, you know, you, in the aftermath of the war, you have this this period of chaos and looting, and then the insurgency starts to break out. And a lot of folks were kind of surprised by that, at least outside uh, outside government. Uh, how how much did decision makers know that this could be coming, and how much did they do ahead of time to prevent it from happening? So the answer to the second question is almost nothing, and in some cases, actively decided against it. There were proposals, for example, specific proposals debated at the NSC to send 5,000 uh, military police to help keep order afterwards, and that was rejected. You know, the whole concept of this was light footprint. This was Rumsfeld stamp on this, but also others who wanted to sort of make this an Iraqi thing, not an American thing. They had the Afghan example they could point to. We went in with a few thousand people, propped up a local leader, left. And, you know, of course, that didn't work out well. But at the time, it seemed like it was. So the whole idea was, if there's chaos afterward, it's not really our responsibility. I mean, there was one just incredibly both depressing and poignant episode where Jay Garner, the head of ORHA, was talking with Don Rumsfeld about the funding he would need for post-war relief, not even reconstruction, because that wasn't going to be there. He wasn't going to be that long, but he was talking about a billion dollars. And Don Rumsfeld answered, uh, Jay, if you think we're spending a billion dollars of the American taxpayers' money in Iraq, you're sorely mistaken. <laughs> this was the mindset of Rumsfeld and some others at the time, which was, we're just not going to be there that long. It's not our job. The Iraqi army is going to reconstitute itself. New Iraqi leaders will use that army and other things to maintain security, and then we'll be out of there. So. There were absolutely warnings, and there's one especially powerful memo that was done by a Marine colonel that very specifically said, every experience we have in post-intervention societies says you are fairly quickly going to have chaos, looting, violence. And he put it in the memo, this is a win the war and lose the peace scenario, which is exactly what it turned out to be. And I don't know exactly how high. We know that memo went at least to Doug Fife. And the understanding is it went to Rumsfeld, but he did nothing about it, had no discussions about it. There were similar warnings in some intelligence community things. But I asked, you know, a lot of senior officials, there were some in January 2003, a couple of major intelligence community products that came out that raised some of these risks, although in a very conditional way, this could happen, this might happen. And I asked some senior officials, uh, very senior folks, um, you know, did you read these? What impression did they make? And they said, yeah, I read them. And that could happen, but it also might not. And so what am I to make of that? People are telling me things could happen all the time. Meanwhile, they're getting other advice from advocates of the war saying, don't worry about it. There's Iraqis will come out of the woodwork to run their society. Things will calm down. So I think it's 
uh, a case of making some really bad assumptions, both about what was going to happen afterward and what the U.S. role was going to be, that drove that you know utter lack of preparedness for post-war planning. And, and a question that I pursued and and really never was able to get an answer to, because uh, as far as I was able to, I never talked to anybody that Rumsfeld said this to directly. One of my questions was always, did Rumsfeld intentionally sabotage the post-war planning in order to be sure? Because just like George Bush, this is a guy who in February 2003 gave a speech called Beyond Nation Building, where it's it's just mind boggling. This speech basically lays out everything we were about to spend 10 years doing in Iraq and says the United States should never do those things. And this is a month away from launching this invasion. How could you possibly believe that unless you had convinced yourself that as defense secretary, you were going to be able to create the conditions whereby U.S. forces were just going to leave very quickly. And if it fell into chaos, it wasn't going to be our problem. And one way to assure that outcome is if you uh, find every way of putting a barrier in the way of post-war planning so that we don't start doing things very quickly and get drawn into it. Now, that kind of begs the question of if there's violence in a country you just invaded, you can't just run away and let people die. There's no way you're going to do that. And given everything George Bush was saying publicly about caring about the Iraqi people, there was no way he was going to let that happen. So if Rumsfeld thought that, he was a fool. But I've never been able to determine if he really had that kind of motive. But there was a lot of work in the DOD seemingly to kind of actively subvert that post-war planning. So was there an understanding, you know, at any level, like was was the ball dropped somewhere where uh, either people planned to stay longer than DOD prepared for or uh, had bad assumptions about what was going to happen after the war and therefore thought that, uh, you know, they didn't that we wouldn't need to stay or that we wouldn't stay? Uh, or was it that, you know, civilian leadership had this vision and didn't pass it along to the military to execute? So a little bit all of the above. I think the dominant thing, though, was that the real advocates, planners, drivers of the war uh, just thought we wouldn't be there that long. All the planning was around that. You know, there was very specific orders given to military units to begin turning around and leaving Iraq fairly quickly. And if you remember, that's, you know, they had first of all, they had off ramps for a number of units that might have gone in and to sort of make sure that the U.S. forces there ended up being as minimal as possible which is not what you're going to do if you think you're going to have to provide order, because, you know, there were estimates in advance, including my RAND colleague, um, Jim Dobbins, did a study saying you're going to need half a million people to keep order in this country. And that was uh, eventually brought to the president. Um, but, you know, at that point, the answer was sort of, well, we're not doing that. So, you know, I don't know really what to do about it. Um, so the assumption was we were going to be there as minimally and for as short a period of time as possible. And those who and, and, and where that changes really uh, is not until Bremer gets there. And there's just an amazing episode in his memoir where he's got the job, he's preparing for the job and he's he's sort of driving to work. And there's a discussion of handover of authority to the Iraqis or something. And he writes that he almost drew, drove off the George Washington Parkway because in his mind, to achieve the president's goals, he's thinking, I'm going there to take over for a long period of time. We're going to we're going to dig in and be there for a while. That's what we have to do to achieve democratization, if that's what the president wants. So when he comes in, he upsets the apple cart in a way that some of the other this is one of the reasons I think why he gets alienated from uh, Rumsfeld. Some of those who just wanted to keep getting out. Uh, thought that he kind of changed their their policy. Uh, but I think all that was really doing was taking seriously the implications of invading a country that you can't very well invade it and then abandon it to civil war, which is what would have happened. And those who thought we could were just smoking something. So one of the questions we have uh, from the audience is about the relationship of all this to the war in Afghanistan. Do you think mm -hmm. developments in Afghanistan altered how the U.S. approached Iraq? Uh, did it change how we thought about the strategy or the objective? 
Uh, and then, of course, how did Iraq shape Afghanistan? What was the reciprocal? Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's interesting. There's a really kind of like a pinballing analogy thing that goes on there. And the first one is the Afghan analogy powers the Iraq war. Um, there was a time shortly after we're in Afghanistan where we don't remember it now, but people were talking about, OK, the Northern Alliance hasn't won yet. We haven't prevailed. We're getting into a uh, some kind of a quagmire here. Um, and then suddenly we won and the Taliban was thrown out and um, Hamid Karzai was put in place and U.S. forces were down to kind of a minimum. There was a lot of international role. There was a U.N. mandate. And it seemed like a brilliant success in that sense, in the sense of relatively low cost, achieving some of the basic objectives, although we can debate about whether a larger U.S. military presence initially would have had more immediate effect than Al-Qaeda. But that was the lesson. So then that's the lesson that gets imported to Iraq, which is, why are you telling us we can't do this? We just did it. We're going to put Ahmed uh, Chalabi or somebody else like him in power. We're going to get out. It's going to be the same thing. A lot of reasons why it was a, a silly comparison to make, but it was made. But then later on, so Iraq's going back. So, and, and the Iraq war clearly causes a reduction in resources given to Afghanistan um, and delayed the U.S. getting ahead of the growing insurgency there. I don't know how much difference that really would have made in retrospect. Um, but then in Iraq, things go bad and we get the surge, right? And so more troops, new counterinsurgency strategy, new leadership, combined with McChrystal's hunting of uh, a key extremist, uh, that sort of networked analysis approach, but primarily with the Sunni awakening and the, the, uh, the fact that a lot of Iraqis turned against Al-Qaeda and the real extremists there, you have this seeming success of what they call the surge. So then that becomes the analogy for the Afghan surge. <laughs> Um, under the Obama administration. We're going to send some troops. And that was not an exact analogy because I think it was much more tightly tied to we're going to surge and then we're going to begin to get out, which didn't happen. But but that then becomes an analogy where we say, well, if we did it in Iraq and it reduced violence levels, we can do it in Afghanistan and at least politically we'll be better off. So there is this kind of back and forth uh, where each of those wars influences the perception of the other. Another question uh, from Thomas Weeks, who asks, do you think the United States will make similar mistakes and end up attacking Iran or perhaps supporting an Israeli strike? And I guess, you know, I, as I was I was thinking about this today as another, uh, you know, you could see a bit of an analogy in right now, you know, with the, the JCPOA paradigm seemingly kind of falling apart. And I can see you know, possibilities of folks in, you know, in a couple months about how the credibility of the the international community and the, you know, international legal regime uh, is at stake, that we're losing our intelligence, inspectors are losing their access there, or uh, are these just very, uh, very different? So I think they're very different in a whole bunch of ways. I mean, primarily, I just don't see the Biden administration interested. I don't, I don't know, there may be people in the Biden administration who are kind of the Paul Wolfowitz of, you know, perception of Iran in this case, but I really doubt it. I just don't think there's advocates of war. I think they want to achieve U.S. goals without going to war. Um, I was very struck and very impressed with the comments of uh, Secretary of Defense Austin in the last few days about the Taiwan and Ukraine contingencies, saying our primary goal is to, to resolve these diplomatically. Uh, over, you know, over the period of time, um, the current crisis in Ukraine and the Taiwan situation. So my sense is in a lot of the major cases where the U.S. might go to war, at least the current administration um, has a strong priority to avoid those wars, uh, which is to be applauded. Um, so that's one reason I see it as different. Another reason is Iran is not the target that Iraq was um, for a whole bunch of reasons um, that, you know, Things went more quickly than many people assumed in 2003, but it was pretty widely understood that Saddam's military and regime probably could not survive all that long under really significant U.S. military pressure. And I don't know anybody for for geographic and operational reasons, for political reasons, ideological reasons. I just think Iran is a totally different, totally different thing. So I don't. Uh, thankfully, I don't see any 
uh, things on the horizon that look like Iraq in the sense that key members of a U.S. administration are kind of thirsting to make conflict happen. That may have been a little bit true during the last administration. I don't know for sure, but I don't see it as true now. So another set of questions we had, we had a, a few folks asking about uh, about Bremer's role in particular, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether uh, whether he was to blame for uh, some of these failures in the governance of Iraq yeah. uh, after the invasion. I mean, I know there's always been a lot of uh, back and forth about, for instance, how the decision to uh, debathify and disband right. the army uh, were made. Where, where do you come down on all these kinds of questions? So clearly he, um, you know, th those those first two general orders that he gave um, uh, under the, the coalition provisional authority were mistakes in the way they were done and the, the degree to which they were done. Like you say, in terms of the level of bath debathification, Paul Wolfowitz came out later. And, and I've seen some of the declassified documents that this issue was definitely debated and people realize that if you did sort of a comprehensive debathification, you were going to rule out most of the people who knew how to run the country from being in any government. So the problem was what they didn't take seriously was that, uh, along with many other things, that was an inherent dilemma to this whole idea of the war. There was no way of getting around that. There's no way to invade a country run by a totalitarian single party regime and not face the problem that either you're going to leave a bunch of those criminals in place or you're going to strip the government down to the ground and have to rebuild it from scratch. And they practiced complete avoidance about that and sort of thought that there was some sweet spot they could hit of, you know, we won't get rid of teachers if they were in the bath party. But so it was always going to be a problem. Uh, it, bo and then the disbanding of the army. Bremer didn't think those things through well enough. Um, they were done too quickly. The argument about the army was that it had already disbanded itself. It had fragmented. I've talked to a number of U.S. military officers who were very uh, substantially involved in the outreach efforts to the Iraqi army, to commanders. And they are convinced that there was a lot more that could have been done to bring pieces of it back. And that Bremer's order was was completely uh, uh, premature. So, yeah, they were both destructive. Um, and I talked to a variety of folks that said that uh, his leadership style was simply too peremptory. I mean, part of the challenge is he's always made the argument that when you're going to go over and, and sort of run a military occupation, you have to be an autocrat. And I suppose there's a degree to which that's true. But the problem is um, if the decisions you're making are ones that have tremendous consequences and that need really deep uh, sort of analysis to be done right, then you're just going to screw things up by being too uh, peremptory in the way you approach things. So his leadership style was problematic. Those initial decisions were problematic, but he's not responsible as an individual for the collapse of order. Um, the complete lack of seriousness in the undertaking from the beginning is responsible for that. And that can be laid at the feet of, I mean, George W. Bush, certainly, people like Condi Rice, people like Colin Powell, who, although he had very significant doubts and met one time with the president, he did not, I think it is fair to say, use the full force of his office to try to ensure that, I mean, partly because he was respecting his lane. He's not the SECDEF. Rumsfeld's the SECDEF. Powell has been chairman. He knows the distinction as secretary of state. It is not his job. At a certain point, when the United States is about to launch a tragic war, you might come out of that lane and say, well, fine, I'm going to violate some of those principles, but it needs to be done. So I think that this failure, uh, Bremer certainly has a share of it. But to imagine that it could have been dramatically better had he not made those decisions, I just don't think that's the case. The question we've got uh, is if war had somehow been avoided, uh, you know, maybe we hadn't you know, made some of these choices, what would or should have been our plan of action, our policy toward Iraq, you know, post uh, post 2001? Uh, you know, would they would the relationship have have turned south even further? I mean, I know you had said it might have, might end up looking like North Korea does today. 
Well, just in the sense of sort of a permanent standoff, I guess, where they're doing some things we don't like. I mean, I think the policy is pretty straightforward. Um, Number one, we could have demanded international inspections and said that in this new world, we can't live with. I mean, the problem is we're now living with significant nuclear capacity in North Korea and potentially growing nuclear capacity in Iran. So this statement after 9-11 that we can't tolerate a country like Saddam having nuclear weapons turns out not to be true. But we could have said that we could have demanded inspections. We could have continued to press them for all they were worth knowing that they can that they reduce the risk of his getting anything even though we didn't drive it to zero we could have sent um you know uh kind of messages to him that in no uncertain terms said this is a different and new world now and if we sense that you do anything uh to threaten your neighbors or threaten us directly or cooperate in those threats we will obliterate you uh, and then we could have continued to practice containment and deterrence, which was working. Um, you know, we had forces in Kuwait, which we hadn't in 1990. So he was deterred from going there. He was not about to invade Iran again. Um, not going to attack Saudi Arabia directly. Again, the U.S. The U.S. had a regional presence that restricted his options far more than had been the, the case in 1989, 1990. So I think it was. I mean, would that have left? some residual risk that over time, he might have been able to acquire some kinds of weapons of mass destruction and been tempted to give them to terrorists or simply provide financial support or something to terrorists. Sure, that risk exists, but that risk exists with Iran, it exists with North Korea, it exists with Pakistan, it exists with other countries, it might exist with the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. It's not, you know, this is a fundamental issue of The United States has to think about managing risks in a complicated world, not achieving perfect outcomes. And with Iraq, we set the bar so high in the degree of perfection we were demanding that I think it just it completely uh, threw our conception of the strategic challenge out of whack. So in other words, I think I think there was a very clear and obvious alternative option available that would have met U.S. interests, avoided the tragedy of that 10 year war the trillions of dollars spent, the tens of thousands of Iraqi lives lost, the thousands of Americans' lives lost, and the enormous uh, insult to American credibility that that took place around the world. So that's, you know, a tragic war that could have been avoided while still meeting U.S. national security interests. John Ruler asks, was there anybody in in this uh, pre-war process who raised the possibility that Saddam was being coy about not having WMD because he felt the need to do so in order to deter. uh... So the only, so there may have been that I didn't hear about. Uh, There were two uh, things that I saw that were sort of the, the most, the strongest that took issue with the potential intelligence community, um, Well, then I'll mention a third, actually. One was uh, the Joint Staff J2, the intelligence office of the Joint Staff. There's a declassified um, intelligence assessment where the J2 said they went through all the the intelligence and their bottom line was like, you know what? There's decent evidence on some of the chemical stuff, on nuclear stuff. There's just no evidence. This is a supposition that's being made. And I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It's not exactly what they said, but some remarkably clear statements that the quality of the intelligence proving this stuff was very weak. So there's that. The only one that I know of who raised the specific point idea about playing coy, I did speak to one Air Force officer who developed a briefing raising that possibility and started briefing it up his chain. And at some point, I don't know, uh, got to a general officer who said, this is very interesting. Put this back into a drawer and never talk about it again. <laughs> and I think, you know, partly the problem, it speaks to the problem of the decision making environment that existed was this intense perception that if you were not on the team, if you were expressing doubts, you were going to be punished and sidelined. Rumsfeld made that very clear. The opposite of the kind of environment you want to cultivate for good decision making, right? But then the third doubter I will mention is George W. Bush himself. He is not a stupid guy. And when he received the briefing, this led to the famous, the infamous slam dunk comment. Where that came from was 
Tenet and John McLaughlin laying out the intelligence. And frankly, Condi Rice had the same reaction when she first saw it, laying out all the intelligence. And George Bush looked at all this and said, that's the best you got? I thought this was clear. You're not giving me any, any definitive evidence here. I've been out saying this is, this is definitive. And where's the rest of it? I'm not seeing it. And that's when Tenet, which I think was a terrible mistake, said, it's a slam dunk, Mr. President. Don't worry about it. You know, we can tell you it's a slam dunk. I've always wondered if at that moment he or, I mean, it would have to have been him, if he had said, you know, Mr. President, it's a very good question you ask. And what you have just highlighted is that there may be an assumption going on of how strong this intelligence is that we should question. I'm going to put a red team on it. We're going to come back to you. There's no head of U.S. intelligence that's going to say that in that moment because uh, it would question everything they'd been working on. Right. But it's fascinating that when the when the best evidence was laid out in front of George W. Bush, who's not a big reader, doesn't have a huge history of consuming intelligence products he immediately saw how weak that evidence was. And so, uh, you know, it, but, but the, the kind of general assumption was that it was so strong. And when people would see little snippets, I think maybe subconsciously they would assume there was a lot more somewhere. But uh, yeah, as far as I only came across one person who explicitly raised the idea that Saddam was trying to make the world think he had nukes and he really didn't. So all the mention of intelligence, I think, you know, invites questions about that uh, that domain's uh, role in this, you know, because uh, there's been uh, obviously a lot of conversation about the role intelligence played in it. I know I've seen some talk that uh, the the IC had kind of failed in the opposite direction in the past right. and said yes. they don't have any kind of serious WMD program. And then we get in after 91 and realize, oh, uh, yeah. we, he actually kind of did. Uh, and so there might have been some some questioning or a tendency in the IC to push the estimates upward in in uh, in confidence and aggress whether he had it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there have also been questions about intelligence. Press, you know, that there may have been annals. You know, you always hear like the Office of Special plans right. mentioned, you know, and talk of what was raw intelligence, getting to top level people. Right. Uh, you know, how do, how do you see the, the IC? Yeah. So on, uh, I mean, both of those are good questions. On the first question, there's no question that the IC was burned by the experience of um, the first Gulf War when they went in afterwards. And some of the reporting that came out said they discovered Saddam was maybe a year away from um, uh, uh, material for a nuclear weapon, and the intelligence community had not been saying that. So they, um, you know, just, there were it was definitely in some of their minds. We don't want to get caught that way again. I don't think it ever led. I mean, and I've interviewed a bunch, interviewed a bunch of people from the intelligence community, and like everybody else in the story. They're professionals who are trying to do their job as best they can. And I don't know that many, if any, would have consciously exaggerated things, but they certainly were not going to underplay the risk based on that earlier experience. In terms of the Office of Special Plans and Raw Intelligence, um, it was definitely a phenomenon. It happened through the vice president's office as well as through OSD. Um, you eventually get Colin Powell before his speech to the UN, having to spend days up in New York with his staff slashing through the draft speech that Scooter Libby had written to cut out all of the bad intelligence, you know, being helped by the CIA to call this stuff out. So it's definitely real. But the arguments that were made at the time and afterward that this is what caused the war, that, you know, by feeding this raw intelligence and faked intelligence in some of it provided by the Iraqi National Congress, Chalabi's group, right, that that caused the war? I don't think so. I think there was plenty of uh, pre-existing views and um, actual intelligence in the U.S. intelligence community that this extra stuff proved to be mostly window dressing rather than the real cause of the war. All right. Well, that is all the time that we have. Uh, Dr. Mazar, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. The book, again, uh, came out in 2019. It's Leap of Faith, Hubris, Negligence, and America's Greatest Foreign Policy Tragedy. 
Uh, I've dropped the link to our next event in the chat. Thank you everybody for coming out and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.